brother. That was a joy. Mm -hmm. Your messages are a joy. Please turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 26. <clears throat> After that foolish message you preached last week. Well, it's about to really, it's about to really go somewhere, and I want, I want to tell you, we're getting to some of the Nabal. <laughs> we're getting to some of the most um, intense chapters that make me want to cry. In in the scriptures, these chapters we're coming upon, and for a very specific reason, and I want to talk to you about this idea of. A narrative inversion. A narrative inversion. What, 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 what is that? Well, a narrative is a story. And a story has a setting, it has characters, it has a set of circumstances, and it has action and development toward an end. So I think you go to a movie. The movie starts off and you're introduced to the hero or the protagonist or the good person in the film. There are other people who interact with the, our good person. Some are friends, some are foes, some help, some hinder. There's struggle, there's conflict, there's drama, and we build to the end, which is very often something like, for example, a final, um, final showdown between our hero and the thing that's keeping him from his goal or, or the evil in his life. So a value inver a narrative inversion is about flipping the script, turning things upside down. What is up is now down and what was down is now up. Mm. Right before we came down here, I saw somebody interacting, and there's a big push against infant circumcision by the secularists. They're outraged, and they call it a form of mutilation. Now, this is a very interesting thing to me. I saw this one uh, this one meme where the secularist is mocking, making fun of, and outraged at the religious person over this circumcision of a baby. And so you have this secularist screaming how dare you perform this horrible act upon this young child. And the person who had forwarded it to the group I was in said, how would you as a Christian answer this? How would you answer the secularist who is in your face and accusing you of the most horrible of moral outrages for participating in this barbaric ritual and my response was, it's just a clump of cells. Amen. Do you not see it? Do you not see it? These same people who do not mind ending the lives of their own offspring because it's just a clump of cells now object with all the moral energy inside of them to you actually doing something with just a clump of cells. This is what I'm talking about. This is an example of narrative inversion. And narrative inversion is when I come in the room and this way is up and this way is down and I meet somebody who comes up to me and we interact and they insist that that way is up and this way is down. And that's what we're about to have in these coming chapters together. So as we read them, brothers, I want you to just be aware that that's coming. 
this narrative inversion. And where do narrative inversions come from? Narrative inversions are when absolute evil meets absolute good. And they come together in conflict. And in the currents, in the ripples, in the waves that flow out mm. from the conflict between an absolute good and an absolute evil, you have these narratives and you have these inversion of values. And right now, maybe you're saying to yourself, huh? I'm not sure I follow you. Well, we're going to point it out as we come through it in the chapters, but I just want to share with you that it's coming. It's coming and it's in this land. It is in our own land today. For example, take the abortion issue I just mentioned. The same people who will end the life of their own offspring because it's just a clump of cells will then point at you and invert the narrative. How dare you circumcise your child? Wait a minute. I thought you said it was just a clump of cells. Here's the point. Good and evil don't have fellowship with each other. They instead struggle. And it's about domination. And if you will not join evil, if you will not bend the knee to their domination, then you will be destroyed. So let's take a look, and we're about to see a very sad value inversion coming. So let's start at 1 Samuel chapter 26. Once again, verse 1, some people from Ziph went to Gibeah to talk with Saul. David has a hideout on Mount Hakila near Jeshimon, out in the desert, they told him. Saul took 3,000 of Israel's best soldiers. <laughs> Hang on, what? What had just happened? Remember David had come into the, had come up to Saul while he was relieving himself and cut a little piece of his garment off and then shamed him? And you remember Saul's words? <coughs> Saul is crying. He's, he's winning an Oscar for his crying performance. David, my son, how oh, I have wronged you. It's now just a chapter later. And Saul took 3,000 of Israel's best soldiers, verse 2, and went to look for David there in the Ziph Desert. Do you understand this? The people of Israel are surrounded by the Philistines. They're surrounded by their enemies. And Saul is taking his best infantry and going after his own captain. This is a value inversion. This is an unhinged king. This is absolute evil butting into absolute good. Mm. Verse 3. Saul set up camp on Mount Hakila, which is across the road from Jeshimon, but David was hiding out in the desert. When David heard that Saul was following him, surprise, surprise, he sent some spies to find out if it was true. Then he sneaked up to Saul's camp. He noticed that Saul and his army commander, Abner, the son of Ner, were sleeping in the middle of the camp, and soldiers were sleeping all around him. David asked Ahimelech the Hittite and Joab's brother Abishai which one of you will go with me in Saul's camp? I will, Abishai answered. That same night David and Abishai crept into the camp. Saul was sleeping and his spear was stuck in the ground not far from his head. By the way, what kind of spear was it? It was a David killing spear. Well, the text does not say this, but do you remember the spear of Goliath? And how Goliath's spear was so fearsome because it had the head, the tip of iron. 
Now we are in the late Bronze Age, early Iron Age. So the culture is transitioning from weapons made out of bronze to weapons made out of iron. And so it does not explicitly state that here. But I think we want to consider the possibility that Saul has bought into the high tech of his day. Now, Abishai whispered, This time, God has let you get your hands on the enemy. I'll pin him to the ground with one thrust of his own spear. <laughs> what is Abishai saying? Look, you were a fool to let him go the first time, but now you got your second chance. Don't mess it up. Then David whispered back, <coughs> Don't kill him. The Lord will punish anyone who kills his chosen king. As surely as the Lord lives, the Lord will kill Saul, or Saul will die a natural death, or be killed in battle. But I pray that the Lord will keep me from harming his chosen king. Do you know the verse? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Let's continue in verse 11. David said, Let's grab his spear and his water jar and get out of here. David took the spear and the water jar, left the camp. None of Saul's soldiers knew what had happened or, or even woke up. The Lord had made all of them fall sound asleep. David and Abishai crossed the valley and went to the top of the next hill where they were a safe distance away. Now, by the way, before we get go any further in this text, I saw a fascinating documentary. One of the things that scoffers have said was made the Bible untrue was that when the Israelites were on one hill and the Philistines were on another hill the hills were so far apart that they couldn't possibly have communicated to each other the way the Bible says that they communicated to each other and I saw this fascinating documentary on YouTube maybe a week or two ago and they went to that exact valley and they went in between the valley between two hills where they thought it was likely that the Philistines and the Israelites had gone. And one of the persons stayed on the one side and the other person went down a short ways into the part way into the valley but still on the other side. And the person there shouted the message and it was 250, 300 yards or more. I'm not sure how far it was. I thought to myself, there's absolutely no way sound could travel that far. Well, by gum and by golly, this person shouted a message, and this person over here heard it. And they recorded. It was amazing. So don't let what skeptics say has to be impossible. Don't be so easy. So here we are here. David has taken the spear and he's went up side. Uh, this is a different place, not the same place where, where the Philistines and Israel were, but this is on another, uh, another similar situation. David went on top, uh, crossed the valley and went to the top of the next hill, a safe distance away. And then David shouted, Abner, can you hear me? He shouted toward Saul's army. Abner shouted back, Who dares disturb the king? David replied, Abner, what kind of a man are you? Aren't you supposed to be the best soldier in Israel? Then why didn't you protect your king? Anyone who went into your camp could have killed him tonight. You're a complete failure. I swear by the living Lord that you and your men deserve to die for not protecting the Lord's chosen king. Look and see if you can find the king's spear and the water jar that were near his head. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Here's my point. 
these were very specific weapons. These, you know, the king's accoutrements were special. And now, they're missing. Whoops! Verse 17. Saul could tell it was David's voice, and he called out. Listen to this. David, my son, is that you? Yes, it is, your majesty. Why are you after me? Have I done something wrong? Have I committed a crime? Please listen to what I have to say. If the Lord has turned you against me, maybe a sacrifice will make him change his mind. But if some people have turned you against me, I hope the Lord will punish them. What's he saying? Turn from this madness. I'm not your enemy. He continues, They have forced me to leave the land that belongs to the Lord and have told me to worship foreign gods. Don't let me die in a land far away from the Lord. I'm no important, no more important than the flea. Why should the king of Israel hunt me down as if I were a bird in the mountains? Saul said, David, you had the chance to kill me today, but you didn't. I was very wrong about you. It was a terrible mistake for me to try to kill you. I've acted like the fool, but I'll never harm you again. You're like a son to me, so please come back. What a snake in the grass. Your Majesty, here's your spear, David said. Have one of your soldiers come and get it. The Lord put you in my power today, but you are his chosen king, and I wouldn't harm you. The Lord rewards people who are faithful and live right. I saved your life today, and I pray that the Lord will protect me and keep me safe. David, my son, I pray that the Lord will bless you and make you successful. Saul is about as two-faced as can be. Now Saul went back home. David left, and starting at birth in chapter 27 here is when it gets really sad. It gets sad for a reason. David also left, but he thought to himself, here it comes. One of these days, Saul is going to kill me. What's happening? He's given up. Now I want to tell you something. We're getting to that narrative inversion that I talked about. Up is down, down is up, left is right, right is left. What tastes good now tastes bad, what's bad now tastes good. <clears throat> and it's very confusing. It's one of the reasons why the Lord hates evil. Because when you hang around evil, your whole moral compass gets screwed up. Even David's here. And you can say, I can't relate to that. Well, I want to tell you something. I don't know if I could relate to it either. But as most of you know, I'm a cancer survivor. <clears throat> And when I was diagnosed with my cancer about two years ago, I had a pain in my abdomen that just would not let go. And 24 hours a day, seven days a week, day in, day out, no time off. Didn't take a holiday off. It didn't stop for Christmas. Didn't stop hurting on the weekends. Didn't stop hurting when we were traveling on the road and it didn't stop when I was in my bed at night. It just hurt. And I want to tell you something. I was strong for maybe the first four to six months. And I want to tell you after six, four to six months of this daily amount of pain, I was coming apart. couldn't take it anymore. Day in and day out pain can put you and drive you to a place you never thought you'd go. 
and it was starting to push me there. I praise God that He was so good to me. But I want to tell you that evil in your life, evil people in your life, is like having a cancerous tumor. Because day in and day out, they vex your spirit. They push you harder and further than you never thought you ever thought you could bear. And now finally David's cracking. So here it says, verse 20, uh, chapter 27. David thought to himself, one of these days, Saul is going to kill me. The only way to escape from him is to go to Philistia. Do you hear that? His only safety lies in going to the enemy. Then, he says, I'll be outside of Israel and Saul will give up trying to catch me. David and his 600 men went across the border to stay in Gath with King Achish, the son of Maok. His men brought their families with them. David brought his wife Ahinoam, whose hometown was Jezreel. And he also brought his wife Abigail, who had been married to Nabal from Carmel. When Saul found out that David had run off to Gath, he stopped trying to catch him. Isn't that interesting? <clears throat> Think about the dereliction of duty. Saul was chasing his own best captain to murder his own best captain. And then when his own best captain left and went to the enemy, the enemy that he ought to be squaring off against and warring against, Saul felt no duty then and here's how it is with evil. Here's how it will go in the American Civil War if we have one. I pray that it doesn't happen. But friends, there's some pretty serious signs on the wall. And it isn't going to be some nice, fair fist fight where two sides come up and have this nice, fair and open conflict where we talk things through. No. The government is going to stop caring about its legitimate enemies and is instead going to start going after its very own. That's what happens in civil wars. And that's what happens when absolute good and absolute evil butt heads. David has a strong personality. He's a strong man. He's strong mentally. He's strong in the Lord, and yet even he has reached his breaking point. Just like I reached my breaking point with pain. So too, it can happen to any one of us. What, what are you going to do if you're a Hinnom and Abigail, and you're raising young children up in the Philistine city? and you see your children running and playing with the local children. Wow. What are you going to do now that the enemy is your only friend in this world? Wow. Now, David had run off to Gath. And by the way, what is the significance of Gath? Who was from Gath? Goliath. He ran to, he ran to Goliath's own hometown. That's got to tell you something. First of all, how desperate David was. Second of all, how evil Saul was. And third of all, how screwed up and messed up loyalties had become 
For remember, what had brought Saul to that area had been the inhabitants of that area turning on David. So, one day David was talking with Achish, the king of Gath, and said, If you're happy with me, then let me live in one of the towns in the countryside. I'm not important enough to live here with you in the royal city. Achish gave David the town of Ziklag that same day, and Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah ever since. Now why does David not want to be in the royal city? Well, he doesn't. Very enemies. Yeah, he doesn't want to. He doesn't want. First of all, he doesn't want his actions, as we're going to see, he doesn't want his actions to be seen by the king. And also, he doesn't want to be seen by the king. You know, there's. This is a sad. This is a sad story. This makes you, makes me want to cry, to see what's coming in these next verses. David was in Philistia, verse seven, for a year and four months. The Jeshurites, Gerzites, and the Malachites lived in the area from Tilam to Shur and on as far as Egypt. And David often attacked their towns. Whenever David and his men attacked a town, they took the sheep, cattle, donkeys, camels, and the clothing, and killed everyone who lived there. Why did David kill everyone who lived there? Dead men, tell them to tell you. Dead men don't talk. After he returned from a raid, David always went to see Achish, who would ask, Where did you attack today? David would answer, Oh, you know, we were just in some desert town that belonged to the tribe of Judah. Or David would sometimes say, oh, we attacked a town in the desert where the Jeremiel clan lives, or we attacked a town in the desert where the Kenites lived. That's why David killed everyone in the towns he attacked. He thought, if I let any of them live, they might come to Gath and tell what I've really been doing. And friends, what has David really been doing? Killing Philistines. He's been killing Philistines and their allies. This isn't a very pretty picture of God's man. But it's the truth. David made all these raids all the time he was in Philistia. But Achish trusted David and thought, David's people must be furious with him. From now on he will have to take orders from me. So what is Achish thinking? He's thinking, wow, if he's going and raiding and destroying the, the towns in his former land, well boy, they're sure done with him. That means I can trust him. <laughs> now, I'm not excusing what David is doing here. This is a sad day. This is a black eye on David. This is a black eye on godliness. This is a black eye on God's people. So what I'm about to tell you next is not excusing what David